was a little alley in San Francisco, back of the Southern Pacific Station at 3rd and Townsend, in red brick of drowsy, lazy afternoons with everybody at work in offices. In the air, you feel the impending rush of their commuter frenzy. As soon, they'll be charging en masse from market and sansom buildings on foot and in buses and all well-dressed through working man Frisco of walk-up truck drivers. And even the poor grime be marked third street of lost bums, even Negroes so hopeless and long left east and meanings of responsibility and try that now all they do is stand there spitting in the broken glass, sometimes 50 in one afternoon against one wall at 3rd and Howard. Here's all these Milbray and San Carlos neat necktied producers and commuters of America and steel civilization rushing by with San Francisco Chronicles and green call bulletins, not even enough time to be disdainful. They've got to catch 130, 132, 134, 136, all the way up to 146 till the time of evening supper in homes of the railroad earth, when high in the sky the magic stars ride above the following hot shot freight trains. It's all in California. It's all a sea. I swim out of it in afternoons of sun-hot meditation in my jeans with head on handkerchief on brakeman's lantern or, if not working, on book. I look up at blue sky of perfect lost purity and feel the warp of wood of old America beneath me. And I have insane conversations with Negroes in second-story windows above, and everything is pouring in. The switching moves of boxcars in that little alley, which is so much like the alleys of Lowell, and I hear far off in the sense of coming night that engine calling our mountains. But it was that beautiful cut of clouds I could always see above the little SP alley. Puffs floating by from Oakland, or the gate of Marin to the north, or San Jose south. The clarity of Cal to break your heart. It was the fantastic drowse and drum hum of lum mum afternoon, nothing to do. Old Frisco with end of land sadness. The people, the alley full of trucks and cars of businesses nearabouts. Nobody knew or far from cared who I was all my life, 3,500 miles from birth all opened up and at last belonged to me in great America. Now it's night in Third Street. The keen little neons and also yellow bulb lights of impossible to believe flops. The dark ruined shadows moving back of torn yellow shades like a degenerate China with no money. The cats in Annie's alley. The flop comes on, moans, rolls. The street is loaded with darkness. Blue sky above with stars hanging high over old hotel roofs and blowers of hotels moaning out dusts of interior. The grime inside the word in mouths falling out tooth by tooth. The reading rooms tick tock big clock with creek chair and slant boards and old faces looking up over rimless spectacles bought in some West Virginia or Florida or Liverpool, England pawn shop long before I was born. And across rains, they've come to the end of the land sadness, end of the world gladness. All your San Francisco will have to fall eventually and burn again. But I'm walking, and one night, a bum fell into the hole of the construction job where they're tearing a sewer by day. The husky Pacific and electric youths in torn jeans who work there, often I think of going up to some of them like, say, blonde ones with wild hair and torn shirts, and they say, you ought to apply for the railroad, it's much easier work. You don't stand around the street all day and you get much more pay. But this bum fell in the hole, you saw his foot stick out. British MG, also driven by some eccentric, once backed into that hole. And as I came home from a long Saturday afternoon local, the Hollister, out of San Jose, miles away across virtuous fields of prune and juice joy, here's this British MG backed and legs up, wheels up into a pit and bums and cops standing right outside the coffee shop. It was the way they fenced it, but he never had the nerve to do it due to the fact that he had no money and nowhere to go and oh, his father was dead, no, oh, his mother was dead, no, oh, his sister was dead, no, oh, his whereabout was dead, was dead. But and then at that time also, I used to lay in my room on long Saturday afternoons listening to Jumpin' George with my fifth toque, no tea, and just under the sheets laughed to hear the crazy music. Mama, he treats your daughter mean. Mama, Papa, don't you come in here, I'll kill you, etc. 
getting high by myself in room glooms, and all wondrous knowing about the Negro, the essential American, out there, always finding his solace, his meaning in the Fellaheen street, and not an abstract morality. And even when he has a church, you see the pastor out front bowing to the ladies on the make. You hear his great vibrant voice on the Sunday afternoon sidewalk full of sexual vibratos saying, why, yes, ma'am, but the gospel do say that man was born of woman's womb. <laughs> no, and so, by that time, I come crawling out of my warm sack and hit the street. When I see the railroad ain't gonna call me till 5 a.m. Sunday morning, probably, for a local out of Bay Shore. In fact, always for a local out of Bay Shore. And I go to the whale bar of all the wild bars in the world, the one and only Third and Howard. And there I go in and drink with the madmen, and if I get drunk, I get girl who come up to me in there one night, I was there with Al Buckle, said to me, you want to play with me tonight, Jim? And I didn't think I, <laughs> I didn't think I had enough money. And I told this to Charlie Lowe, and he laughed, said, how do you know she wanted money? Always take the chance that she might be out just for love, or just out for love. You know what I mean. Don't be a sucker. She was a good-looking doll. And she said, how would you like to ool your cool with me, mon? And I stood there like a jerk. In fact, bought drink, got drink drunk that night in the 299 Club. I was hit by the proprietor, the band breaking up the fight. Before I had a chance to decide to hit him back, which I didn't want to do anyway. And out on the street, I tried to rush back in, but they had locked the door and were looking at me through the forbidden glass in the door with faces like undersea. I should have played with her shoo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-
with piercing clear lament, in perfect tune and shining harmony, toot, as listeners reacted without showing it and began talking. And soon the whole joint is rocking and talking and everybody talking, and Charlie Parker whistling them on to the brink of eternity with his Irish St. Patrick patoodle stick. And like the holy miss, we blop and we plop in the waters of slaughter and white meat and die one after one in time. And how sweet a story it is when you hear Charlie Parker tell it, either on records or at sessions or at official bits and clubs, shots in the arm for the wallet. Gleefully, he whistled the perfect horn. Anyhow, it made no difference. Charlie Parker, forgive me. Forgive me for not answering your eyes. For not having made an indication of that which you can devise. Charlie Parker, pray for me. Pray for me and everybody in the nirvanas of your brain where you hide indulgent and huge. No longer Charlie Parker, but the secret unsayable name that carries with it merit not to be measured from here to up, down, east or west. Charlie Parker, lay the bane off me and everybody. Mill Valley trees, the pines with green mint look, and there's a tangled eucalyptus hulk stick fallen through the late sunlight tangle of those needles, hanging from it like a live wire connecting it to the ground. Just below, the notches where little Fred sought to fell the sad pine, not bleeding much, just a lot of crystal sap the ants are mining in, motionless like cows on the grass, and so they must be aphids percolating up the steam to store provender in their bottomless bellies that for all I know are bigger than the bellies of the universe beyond. The little tragic windy cottages on the high last city ward hill and today roosting in sun hot dream above the tree head of seas and meadow patch whilst tea key key pearl the birdies and mommums mark and ululate moodily in this valley of peaceful firewood in stacks that make you think of Oregon in the morning in 1928 when Back was home on the range lake and his hunting knife threw away and went to sit among the ponderosa pines to think about love his girl's bare bodice like a fennel seed the navel in her milk bun Shorty McGonagall and Roger Nulty held up the Boston bank and murdered a girl in these old woods and next you saw the steely green iron photograph and true detective showing black blotches in the black blotch running culvert by the dirty roadside, not Oregon at all. Or Jim back so happy with his mouth, a blade of grass depending. Hummingbird hums hello, bugs race and swoop. Two ants hurry to catch up with lonely Joe. The tree above me is like a woman's thigh. Smooth eucalyptus bumps and muscle swells. I would I were a weed a week would leave. Why was the rat mixed up in the sun? Because Bodhidharma came from the west with dark eyebrows and China had a mountain wall and mists get lost above the Yangtze Gorge and this is a mysterious yak the bird makes yik. Wow, wow, what sings the dog blood blood Blup below the homestead deer. Red robins with saffron scarlet or orange rudd breasts make a racket in the dry dead car crashed tree Neil mentioned. He went off the road into eucalyptus. And it's all busting out, indicating the prune blossoms. And Bodhi Dharma came from the India West to seek converts to his wall gazing. Ended up with Zen magic monks mopping each other and one and all and other in mud koan puddles to prove the crystal void. Wow. <laughs> A 
keep falling in love with my mother. I don't want to hurt her. Of all people to hurt. Every time I see her, she's grown older. But her uniform always amazes me for its Dutch simplicity and the doll she is, the doll-like way she stands, bow-legged in my dreams, waiting to serve me. And I am only an Apache, smoking hashi in old kabashi by the lamp. Goofing at the table, you just don't know. What don't I know? How good this ham and eggs is. If you had any idea whatsoever how good this is, then you would stop writing poetry and dig in. It's been so long since I've been hungry. It's like a miracle. Ah, boy, but them bacon and them egg. <laughs> Mr. Beggar and Mrs. Davy, loony and croony. I made a poem out of it. Haven't smoked loony and croony in a long time. Them eggs and them, them, their bacons, baby. If you only lay that down on a trumpet, lay that down solid, brother, about all them bacon and eggs. You gotta be able to lay it down solid. All that loony and froony, frakens, akens, and begs. Lay it. All that be bobby, be buddy, I didn't took, I could think so, be pop, be boppy, loony and juny. That's the way they get kind of hysterical. Loony and boony, juner and mooner, moon, spoon and june. Don't they call them cat men that lay it down with the trumpet? I call them them cat things. That's really cute, ain't it? William Carlos Williams. <laughs> the Bowery Blues. Cooper Union Cafeteria. Late cold March afternoon. The street, 3rd Avenue, is cobbled, cold, desolate with trolley tracks. Some guy on the corner is waving his hand down, knowing somebody emphatically. And out of sight behind a black and white pillar, cold clowns in the moment horror of the world. A Puerto Rican kid with a green stick stooping to bat the sidewalk but changing his mind and halting on. Two new small trucks parked. The withery gray rose stone building across the street with its rhyme heights in the quiet winter sky. Inside are quiet workers by neon and tablatures practicing fanning lessons with the murderous marble. A yakking blonde with awful wide smile is macking her mouth lip talk to an old bodhisattva papa on the sidewalk. The tense quickness of her hard working words. Meanwhile, a funny bum with no sense tries to panhandle them and is waved away stumbling. He doesn't care about society, women embarrassed with paper bags on sidewalks. Unutterably sad, the broken winter shattered face of a man passing in the bleak ripple followed by a Russian boxer with an expression of Baltic lostness. Something grim and Slavic and so helplessly beyond my conditional ken or ability to evaluate and believe that I shudder as at the touch of cold stone to think of him. The sickened old awfulness of it like slats of wood wall in an old brewery truck. For I prophesy that the night will be bright with the gold of old in the inn within. Shin McIntario with no money, no bets, no health, hauls on by pawing his inside coat, no hope of ever seeing Miami again since he lost his pickles on Orchard Street. 
and his father stootle fedded him to hospitals of gray bleak bone drying in the moon that mortifies his coat and words sing what mind brings bleeding bloody seamen of indian england battering in coats of third avenue with no sense and their brows streaked with wine sop blood of obliglit sad adventurers far from the pipe of liverpool the bean of bone bottle liffy brown far hung unseen top tippers of ocean wave god bless and sing for them as i cannot Cooper Union Blues, the Muzak is too sod. The gaiety of grave candidates makes my gut weep, and my brains are awash down the side of the blue orange table. As little sneery, snurfling Puerto Rican hero bats by booming his coat pocket, fisting to the vicinity where mortuary waits for bait. What kind of service do broken garrels give? Oh, have pity. Bodhisattva of intellectual radiance. Save the world from her eyebrows of beautiful illusion. Hope. Oh, hope. Oh, nope. Oh, Pope. Abraham, drinking water by the tents, pacing up and down the soft sand under the stars, worrying about villages, wondering if your vision was real or just a foolish importunity in your mind, yet moving on in the morning anyway with the rattle of pack asses. Abraham, the dew is in your beard. Abraham, my eyes are open. You are weird. Abraham, they've brought you. Your rooftops are mended. Your women bend no more their heads under the sleepy tent flap. And goats don't you and cry no more in the sing-song tent village night. Abraham, I didn't write this right. New York Club wishes to announce the opening of new sessions and new fields, Daddy-O, Dave Brubeck's The Swingingist, and I wish to say farewell to Al Smith. Hello, Dave. I had a slouch hat too one time, the old slouch hat. I just keep walking around and he keeps walking around with me, around and around that necktie counter we went. When it rained, I wore my old slouch hat. It was a good felt that I uh, had to carry through many rainy days, late fall and early spring. Perhaps it was a rainy day and the house dick might have saw my hat. Each tie on that ring worth six bucks. Brooks Brothers, 60 bucks worth of ties. Slacks with peculiarities. I couldn't even find a pair of slacks I thought it was suitable to wear. Wrapped one pair around me and pinned it in with a safety pin. <laughs> Pulled up my trousers and went out and looked at myself in the mirror. Oh no, those won't do, and I walked out. Wrapped the slacks around my waist. Took two other pair, went to the mirror, threw them at the salesman. No, those won't do. Good afternoon, and walked out. The slouch hat I got at Harvard Club, Yale Club, Princeton Club, or one of the other Dartmouth Club, University Club. Always barred the Yacht Club, because it was a little over my kin. Because the doorman knew that only Mr. Astor, Mr. Vanderbilt, and Mr. Whitney belonged. He couldn't say, good morning, Mr. Astor, because he knew I wasn't Mr. Astor. I always figured a way to heal into those other clubs. Not only a member of who's who, 
But a who's who also have to be a member of who's who in New York in the special clique of who's. <laughs> I get in the athletic club many times. And I'd go up in the billiard room and I would wander back around the room, hands and back, and every coat rack I backed up against the field for the wallet. One day I walked out of there with ten wallets. Bellboy looking me over. Pretty soon a very dignified looking gentleman come up and buzzed the bellboy. He says, who? And I says, man told me his name while we're drinking at the bar and told me to meet him in this billiard room in the athletic club. I don't see him, so I best I better go. Well, tell me about the old slouch hat. Oh, one of my numerous trips to one of the numerous clubs in New York City. The hat finally was left in the hotel, which I had to leave rather hardly one night, never to return. So the hat was given to the cast-offs of the hotel, which they collect and rummage sells. May now be worn by one of the members of Skid Row, New York City, the Bowery. I seen that hat by moonlight. Yeah. I had a pointed mustache, and I mean pointed, half an inch from here. Double-breasted vest and a derby hat and striped trousers, English shoes, black, very pointed. They were Hannah shoes. People on Broadway turn and look at me. The worst is yet to come. I had a paint sneer with a long black ribbon to my buttonhole. And I wore a carnation, white or red. Boy, did I look like something. A year later, I got caught. I was dressed differently and everything, but boy, that mustache and that pince nex was really out of this world. I used that outfit six months. Finally had to pack it in because it was too well worn. Pince nez was in a coat I stole. Mustache I grew in the sanitarium while taking one of my numerous drug cures. My mother had come to see me. She says, oh no, cut it off. I'm just having a little fun, mother. Took it on the lamb and went to Canada. Late at night, I'm full of morphine and I come down full of goofballs too. This guy had ventriloquist doll and he gave out this Texas guinan routine. Hello, sucker. We like your money as well as anybody else's. As a matter of fact, the bigger your roll, the more we take you. He used to get everybody interested with the doll and cut out silhouettes, put stripes in your tie. Wound up in his room, gave him a shot of morphine. Out on the highway, I thumbed the ride into Buffalo, and I put the bum on the guy for something to eat. He said, eat in my drugstore. So we went in the back, and he had corn on the cob and boiled potatoes. Say, fella. I always hear people talk about morphine. What's it look like? He shows me. He had a key, a cabinet. He had bottles of hundreds, quarter grains, half grains, pentapon, dilated, everything. As soon as he tended the customers, I emptied the bottles. Got out of there pretty quick. Bought a safety pin in Buffalo and took a shot in the toilet. Come out and saw a fella shaving. His coat hanging there. Hung my own coat and gave his coat a brush with my hand. Felt his wallet, washed my hands, went out and took off with the wallet. So I started out on a shoplifting campaign in Buffalo. It was about 1910. Wasn't very experienced at it. Started out with a top coat and sold it in the taxi cab stand. Next day I decided to get myself some suits and I went up and I had a suit box and I walked about and put the suit box in one of the dressing rooms, looked and fooled in the mirror, went out and I hawked those two. Next day, like a damn fool, go out to the same store, but I got a newspaper instead of a suit box, thought I'd try a new routine. Two guys kind of watching me. I went in, wrapped myself up, two suits, went in the elevator. Bottom gentleman tapped me on the arm. Will you come with me, please? And the county jail, they ate breakfast. You got oatmeal with one spoonful of molasses. For lunch, stew, mostly bones, graveyard stew. And for supper, dinner at night, beans. And you couldn't smoke. Conception turns in the void, 
expelling human beings, pigs, turtles, frogs, insects, nits, mice, lice, lizards, rats, grown racing horses, poxy, bucolic pig ticks, horrible, unnameable lice of vultures, murderous attacking dog armies of Africa, rhinos roaming in the jungle, vast boars, and huge, gigantic bull elephants, rams, eagles, condors, pones, and porcupines, and pills. All the endless conception of living beings, gnashing everywhere in consciousness, throughout the ten directions of space, occupying all the quarters in and out, from super microscopic no bug to huge galaxy light year bowel illuminating the sky of one mind. Poor. I wish I was free of that slaving meat wheel, safe in heaven dead. The goofy, foolish, human parade passing on Sunday art streets of Greenwich Village. Pitiful drawings of, an, of images on an iron fence ranged there by self-believing artists with no hair and black berets showing green seas eating at rock and pleiades of time, pestiferating at moon squid, salt flat tip fly toe tat sand traps with cigar-smoking interests puffing at the stroll. I mean sincerely, naive sailors buying prints. <laughs> Women with red banjos on their handbags. And arts handy, crafty, slow-shuffling artists of Washington Square passing in what they think is a happy June afternoon. Good God, the sorrow. They don't even listen to me when I try to tell them they will die. They say, of course I know I'll die. Why should you mention it now? Why should I worry about it? It'll happen, it'll happen now. I want a good time. Excuse me. It's a beautiful, happy June afternoon. I want to walk in. Why are you so tragic and gloomy? And on the corner at the pony stables on 6th Avenue and 4th sits Bodhisattva meditating in hobo rags, praying at Joe Gould's chair for the emancipation of the shufflers passing by. Immovable in meditation, he offers his hand and feet to the passers-by, and nobody believes that there's nothing to believe in. <laughs> Listen to me. There is no sidewalk art show. No strollers are there. No poem here. No June afternoon of O, but only imagelessness, unrepresented on the iron fence of bald artists with black berets passing by one moment less than this is future nothingness already. The chess men are silent, assembling ready for funny war. Voices of Washington Square Blues rise to my Bodhisattva poem window. I will describe them. Itki salusu fruptur, etc. No need, no words to describe the sound of ignorance. This is the sound of ignorance. They are strolling to their death, watching the pictures of hell, eating ice cream of ignorance on wood sticks that were once sincere in trees. But I can't write poetry, just prose. I mean, this is prose, not poetry. But I want to be sincere. Moon. 
her magic be big sad face of infinity an illuminated clay ball manifesting many gentlemanly remarks she kicks a star clouds foregather in scimitar shape to round her cradle out upside down any old time you can also let the moon fool you with imaginary orange balls of blazing imaginary light in fright as eyeballs hurt and foregathered wink to the winds of the seeing of a little sprightly ote which projects spikes of light out the round smooth blue balloon ball full of mountains and moons deep as the ocean high as the moon low as the lowliest river lagoon fish in the tar and pull in the spar billy the bud and hanshan emperor and all wall moon gazers since daniel mccree yates c gaze at the moon ocean marking the face in some cases the moon is you in any case the moon I'd rather be thin than famous. I don't want to be fat. And a woman throws me out of bed calling me Gordo. And every time I bend to pick up my suspenders from the Davenport floor, I explode loud, huge grunto and disgust everyone in the familio. I'd rather be thin than famous, but I'm fat. Taste that in your Broadway show. Well, a lot of people have asked me why did I write that book or any book. All the stories I wrote were true, because I believed in what I saw. I was traveling west one time at the junction of the state line of Colorado. It's arid western one. In the state line of poor Utah, I saw in the clouds huge and massed above the fiery golden desert of even fall, the great image of God with forefinger pointed straight at me through halos and rolls and gold folds that were like the existence of a gleaming spear in his right hand which saith, Come on, boy, go thou across the ground. Go moan for man. Go moan. Go groan. Go groan alone. Go roll your bones alone. Go thou and be little beneath my sight. Go thou and be my new to seed in the pod. Go thou, go thou, die hence. And of this world report you well and truly. Anyway, I wrote the book because we're all gonna die. In the loneliness of my life, my father dead, my brother dead, my mother far away, my sister and my wife far away. Nothing here but my own tragic hands that once were guarded by a world, a sweet attention that now are left to guide and disappear their own way into the common dark of all our deaths. Sleeping in me raw bed alone and stupid, with just this one pride and consolation, my heart broke in a general despair and opened up inwards to the Lord. I made a supplication in this dream. So in the last page of On the Road, I describe how the hero, Dean Moriarty, has come to see me all the way from the West Coast just for a day or two. We've just been back and forth across the country several times in cars and now our adventures are over. We're still great friends, but we have to go into later phases of our lives. So there he goes, Dean Moriarty, ragged in the moth-eaten overcoat he brought specially for the freezing temperatures of the East. Walking off alone, and last I saw him, he rounded the corner of 7th Avenue, eyes on the street ahead, and bent to it again. Gone. So, in America, when the sun goes down, and I sit on the old broken down river pier watching the long, long skies over New Jersey, and sense all that raw land that rolls in one unbelievable huge bulge over to the west coast, and all that road going, and all the people dreaming in the immensity of it. In an Iowa, I know by now that children must be crying in the land where they let the children cry. And tonight the stars will be out, and don't you know that God is Pooh Bear? 
The evening star must be drooping and shedding her sparkler dims on the prairie, which is just before the coming of complete night that blesses the earth, darkens all the rivers, cups the peaks, and folds the final shore in. Nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen to anybody besides the forlorn rags of growing old. Think of Dean Moriarty, I even think of old Dean Moriarty, the father we never found. Think of Dean Moriarty, I think of Dean Moriarty.